Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is David Dalsey. I'm the Executive Vice President and Provost here at McCain University, and we're excited to be able to welcome you and all the artists for our great discussion today. So on behalf of Gumberg Library and the entire Duquesne University community, our faculty, staff, and students, welcome to this artist panel conversation of Gift of America 2.0, celebrating Max Obanka's murals. Max Obanka's murals um, at St. Nicholas Croatian Catholic Church in Millville are unique and world-renowned. People come from all over the world to see them, but many Pittsburghers don't know about them, or those who do haven't seen them. Uh, the Society to Preserve the Millville Murals of Max Obanko, uh, to publicize the murals more widely and to underscore their continuing relevance, commissioned four Pittsburgh artists to create works that were inspired by Obanko's murals and his themes. And so we're very proud that Duquesne University, through Gumberg Library, and in cooperation with the Society, is presenting these artworks through October 10th that you can see downstairs in the room right as you walk into the library. It's, the only, it's only natural that the Gumberg Library would partner with the Society in presenting this exhibit related to the programming because the themes Mango deals with in his art um, echo the principles of the Catholic um, social justice tradition, um, ideas that are core to the mission of Duquesne University. And I have a few examples just to highlight. There are many more than these, but I want to just highlight some of them. Vanka, and immigration himself speaks to the immigration experience. Anybody who knows about Duquesne and the spirits knows that they, they came here to found this university to help immigrant communities who are working particularly in the steel mills or the associated uh, facilities to help them find uh, a path that was outside of just uh, work in the steel mills. And so we're proud of that part of our history and the spirits continue to work around the world with immigrant uh, communities. Um, they are presently in 64 different countries. Uh, Banco speaks of the white rights of workers and the support of working people is another central tenet of the Catholic uh, teachings related to social justice. Banco speaks uh, justifiably harsh critique about war and seeking and pursuing peace is critical to the Catholic social justice tradition. Finally, Banco addresses <coughs> the uh, rights of poor and criticizes unregulated capitalism. And when we think about um, working for the underserved, working for the poor, uh, this is perhaps the central aspect of the Catholic uh, teachings related to social justice. And really critical, any one number of our students can say that as part of their general education curriculum at Duquesne, they've probably discussed one or more aspects uh, of that as part of their education here. So Vanka's themes uh, find expression in the principles that underline our mission, and so partnering with the Society to bring greater awareness of Banka's murals and the new works um, in the 2.0 exhibit that will inspire them is a perfect fit here for the Gumberg Library and Duquesne University. So I want to extend my, extend my special thanks to University Librarian Sarah Barron for her tremendous leadership of this library and helping to always bring exhibits like this to Duquesne. Uh, and special thanks to Ted Bergfeld uh, for coordinating the exhibit and the events uh, that we're doing around the exhibit so I want to thank you all for joining us, and I want to pass it over to Ted, who's going to introduce Corey um, and set things up for our discussion. So thank you all for coming, and Ted, to you. Thank you. Well, I want to introduce our moderator today. Um, our moderator is Corey Carrington. Corey is an accomplished poet, collagist, and curator from the north side of Pittsburgh, as I went from the north side of Pittsburgh, <laughs> and is also creative director of his own company, Deeper Than Grit Studios. His work in performance, visual art, and curation have been experienced at the August Wilson African American Cultural Center, Carnegie Museum of Art, the Kelly Strayhorn Theater, the Wilmer Jennings Gallery, the Yoshi Miller Milo Gallery, and 625 Madison Avenue, the former headquarters of Ralph In 2016, Corey was chosen by Contemporary Craft as the inaugural Emerging Black Arts Leader Apprentice. He has curated ex exhibitions for the Associated Artists of Pittsburgh, Indiana University of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania IM Gallery, and for the Society to Preserve the Nobel Murals of Max Ivanka, the exhibit that you can see downstairs. And actually, we, we became connected with Corey through the Art for August exhibit last February, and Corey spoke and, and, 
and students were you know, hanging on his every word. And I said to him, Corey, that was really great. Will we ever get a chance to work with you again? And he said, um, well, what about uh, Gift to America 2.0? <laughs> in 2021, Corey was named one of Pittsburgh Magazine's 40 Under 40, and he recently joined the staff of the Hill Community Development Corporation as their cultural and Main Street manager, in which role he will be managing the artistic and cultural initiatives in the Hill District. So, uh, please join me in welcoming Corey Karamis. <laughs> I'm speechless. <laughs> when you read all of that, I'm just like, wow, I, I've been doing all of that. So I'm just, I'm just kind of blown away by uh, that introduction. Thank you so much, Tara. I really appreciate You're that. that. Um, so yeah, I'm Corey Carrington. Uh, I am, uh, not to reiterate what he just said, but you know, I'm an artist, I'm a cautious, um, spoken word artist, uh, creative director of Deeper Than Grit Studios. Um, so I'm just really thankful and glad to be here today, um, especially to, you know, give praise to such a great organization in this society. I just want to give a shout out to Anna, who is our <laughs> She has been a pleasure to work with and um, more generally, uh, the Society and St. Nicholas Catholic Church um, has just been a very influential part of this whole process. Um, I think that, you know, upon starting this process, it was something that was a challenge for me, you know, to work with such a major organization and to kind of like to fuse both of our visions of what Gift to America 2.0 would be. So to see the success of everything that we've been doing so far is just really amazing. So I just have to give Anna a big shout out and give uh, the society a big shout out as well. Um, so we have these props right here. I'm kind of good at like just freestyling and you know, <laughs> going along, going with the flow. So I'm just going to, you know, do what I do. But um, the one of the first questions is, you know, how did I become a curator uh, for this opportunity? And initially, you know, it's kind of like one of those things in Pittsburgh where, you know, it's a small town, everybody knows everybody. So because everybody knows everybody, I think opportunities for artists are just, e they happen easily. Um, so how this came about was I was um, a resident artist with Knott's Land, um, with the Knott's Land Residency. Knott's Land is a bow tie company that was started by African-American woman, her name is Nisha Blackwell. Um, if you're ever in the business of getting a bow tie, please see Knott's Land, uh, they're amazing. But um, Nisha had this residency with, or through Radiant Hall Pittsburgh, which is a, uh, a artist organization in Pittsburgh that had different studios around the city. And because I was a resident artist, but also that I'm a curator, um, the opportunity, I was given two opportunities. One opportunity was to curate an exhibit um, with uh, Indiana University of Pennsylvania. So I did that, that was last summer. And it was this opportunity, uh, Give to America 2.0. So they kind of came to me and was like, hey Corey, would you like to curate these exhibits? You know, Because I guess they reached out to Radiant Hall for, to look for a curator. And they were like, well, hey, Corey Carrington is a curator, let's use him. <laughs> so I was like, you know, sure, why not? Because I'm always trying to challenge myself and do different things. So um, when the Gift to America 2.0 uh, idea was, uh, you know, shared with me, I looked at it and I was like, this is like, this is amazing. This is a no-brainer. So, you know, going to the church initially and, you know, having Anna, like, you know, ex explain the murals and uh, Max Wabanka's mission and you know what he was trying to accomplish by creating the murals. I, my, you know the the wheels in my head just start turning. And I was just like, you know, this is amazing. I was already kind of thinking about people and artists that I would like to share the opportunity with. Um, so when it came about, you know, the process I believe was very competitive. Even though the group was kind of like small, I think that the artists who did apply 
presented very strong work. And um, I think the reason why I chose the four artists that I, I chose was that like each, each artist had their own vision and had their own kind of like uh, language on how they present their art to the world. And I think that with seeing the artwork, um, seeing the Max Ivanka murals and then seeing and knowing what kind of artists they were and what kind of messages they were uh, presenting to the world, I was just like, okay, everybody has, everybody has their own language. Everybody has their own voice of what they're trying to say and what they do say through their artwork. So I was like, hmm, everybody has their own voice. Everybody is like a different person. We have multiple cultures represented up here. Um, multiple perspectives so I was like you know going through it was a long process you know going through the different artists and kind of seeing you know like you know with this person's vision match up with the work you know and just trying to figure out like who would be a good fit and I think that you know for the artists that I chose I think this was the the strongest and the best class of artists that I could pick um, in this inaugural iteration and I'm really excited. Part, part of me is really excited that I know that this is going to keep going on. I don't know if it's going to be called Gift to America 3.0. <laughs> but, um, but I'm very excited to, to be a part of something, the beginning of something that I think is going to be very powerful and impactful uh, in the Pittsburgh art world. So I'm just really excited to um, be here and you know let the artists shine because it's not, really, it's not about me, it's about them. So yeah, definitely want to highlight all the artists. So I'm going to introduce every artist. I'm gonna, I'm, I am gonna read this off of, uh, off of the paper because they're all amazing artists and they deserve, they're all, they deserve each to shine in their own light. So I'm gonna go with Max first. So Max Gonzalez is a muralist, printmaker, curator, educator, and social activist. He is a fourth generation Mexican American Recently moving to a full-time career as an artist, he creates and uh, collaborates with organizations like Boom Concepts, Assemble, Hemispheric Conversations, Urban Art Project, and Rivers of Steel. Maxis envisions his artistic outcome to be a collaboration. I wish to use this project as a way to highlight the voices of the underrepresented while creating a community for those who share common experiences. Christian Dolores is an artist, storyteller, object maker, soundscaper, and cultural provocateur. <laughs> she is the founding member of the Not White Collective. She has an artist residency at the Westmoreland Museum of American Art in collaboration with Boom Concepts. Born in France to an African-American father and German mother, later making Pittsburgh home. Christiana reflects, I know what it is to leave a home you love, to weep for what is familiar, to do what it takes to make this new and unfamiliar place my own, and to keep your family safe amongst those who would tear your family apart. Christiana <laughs> Also, I also want to highlight Christiana because she is what many people would consider in Pittsburgh to be a fairy godmother of the art world, or, or just a regular godmother if you, if you want to take it that way. But um, Christiana has helped me in so many ways uh, in my artistic career, um, in my professional career. Uh, we actually used to be co-workers uh, about two years ago, um, and she's always just been helping me you know, as a leader and, you know, just helping me out as a person. So I just really want to highlight her and give her her flowers while she, while she can ha take them. Um, so I just want to give you a huge shout out. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, I'm going to bring those playlists. <laughs> Director of Women in Sound. She is a second generation Mexican American 
a member of the Not White Collective and the first artist in the Boom Concepts Boom Art Universe residency. Maggie uses text and illustration to address issues around community and identity, often focusing on feminist issues. Through Give to America 2.0, my goal is to my goal is that all people with liminal cultural identities can see my work alongside the Maxo Vonka murals and find an anchor in this uniquely American experience. Thank you, brother. Okay, cool. Also, fun fact about Maggie: the position that I was in at uh, Greater Pittsburgh Arts Council when I was working with Christiana is the same position that Maggie was in uh, maybe like three years before I started. So Maggie is also one of those people who has offered her leadership and her guidance to me even though I might be older than her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but she, I'm, I'm 34. We're the same age. Okay. <laughs> We're peers. Yep, yep, we are peers. So I just want to give Maggie a shout out as well. Maggie is a very talented artist. Great mother, a great person. So, Thanks. yes, yes. Um, and I, I don't know if I'm gonna wait for Q, uh, but he said he got stuck in traffic. He's okay. on his way. But All right, so I'm gonna. Q Perry uh, <laughs> is an African American artist and a Northside Pittsburgher. Uh, responded to Give, Give to America 2.0 to help create and send an uplifting and informative statement. Recognized as one of Pittsburgh's 40 under 40, we were in the same Pittsburgh 40 under 40 class. This spontaneous creator, through solo exhibitions, performance art, and installations, has advocated, inspired creativity, and enhanced learning, living, and working environments throughout the city. Installments have appeared and remain in locations like Urban Academy, Glen Lounge, and the University of Pittsburgh Community Engagement Center in Homewood. Choose inspiration for this project. These themes specifically speak very closely to my community, and I would love the opportunity to use my visual voice to share and keep the conversations going. So everybody give it up for <laughs> so, uh, so we're just going to jump into the conversation. I'm just going to ask um, some questions and you know you can you all can speak, you know, jump in and speak whenever you want to, but I just want it to be like a free flowing conversation. Um, so my first question is, uh, please discuss what it was specifically about Vanka's murals or themes that inspired you to create the piece that you did. Sidebar, uh, what inspired you to apply, because before you could, you know, create the work you had to apply. So what inspired you to apply, um, to be considered as an artist, to, you know, do the, the, ex uh, the exhibit, and um, what was it about the murals that kind of spoke to you and influenced you to create what you created? Uh, Max, you want to go first? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I am a full-time muralist. I've been doing murals full-time for like the past two or three years. Um, so seeing the murals of Max Ivanka, same thing, fish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, like the Inherently, like being a full-time muralist in Pittsburgh, knowing that these murals are so historically significant, uh, kind of made like it is just like such an immediate. Just kind of, like yes, of course, I need to be part of this. Um, equally, like have any of you guys been to? Yeah, I was gonna. Say, I was gonna murals? ask who's seen it. Who's seen them? Two. Cool. <laughs> Wait, there, there, no, there's somebody oh, else who wrote it. Three. Um, yeah. So I mean, definitely, if you have not seen them, check them out. Um, I know that they're described as like murals in a church uh, that like might like limit the scope of what you're imagining, uh, but they are very um, unapologetically like uh, politically provocative, and uh, they're just like a to put it not the nicest way, but almost like a, a zombie like Jesus uh, and uh, married with a like a like a rifle, uh, so. A lot, a lot going on. That's like uh, very, very intense. So, um, my background also with murals comes from graffiti, like uh, not like street art or anything like that, but like real illegal graffiti <laughs> writing. Um, 
I'm originally from the southwest side of Chicago. That's what I grew up doing. It's just a huge part of the culture out there. Um, yeah, and I came here 10 years ago. Um, some of you might know my graffiti name. I write gems. Um, and then I did so much graffiti that it led to me getting arrested as Pittsburgh's Most Wanted in 2016. Uh, Pittsburgh has some of the harshest sentencing in the whole nation against graffiti. I have a friend, uh, Danny Montana, who uh, served a total of five years in jail. Uh, he was a repeat offender. I was looking at two to three years in jail. Uh, my initial restitution was $128,000. Uh, my other friend, Ian Hurt, he got two to three years of state prison um, as a condition of his parole that he just got off of. He couldn't own any mark making instruments, any pens, pencils, crayons, anything. Um, so Pittsburgh has some, by far some of the harshest sentencing in the nation. Um, and it's really just a form of like public appeasement to say, ah, we got the most wanted, we really got the lead out of the water. Uh, so it's, yeah, uh, that's all just to say that Inherently, with my art being this provocative thing in Pittsburgh, where in Chicago it's not that controversial, uh, and knowing that the murals of Max and are, are provocative as well, I mean, you can only imagine even more provocative mm -hmm. during their time. Uh, it, I wanted to create artwork that spoke to the truth of just being the art that it is. Um, and, and a lot of the artwork that I do, um, and murals that I do, murals and initiatives that I do, I try to get more people to paint murals or to get into graffiti or understand spray can art that wouldn't be part of that. Pittsburgh has uh, an extremely white male graffiti scene. Um, Chicago, uh, New York, LA, by difference, they are majority Mexican-American graffiti writers, uh, a lot of women in them. Um, and like there's whole black graffiti crews and yeah, it's just very, very diverse. Uh, where we come to Pittsburgh, it is very majority white guys. Um, so I do do all kinds of like uh, workshops and legal walls. Um, even actually today, I was just with a queue earlier. Um, we were we have this annual thing where we get together a bunch of boom concepts artists and all black artists, and we teach them about muralism and art and have them paint at the carry furnaces. Um, yeah, so I'm always trying to challenge who is doing graffiti, who has access to that, because graffiti, graffiti art, muralism, is an art form that really just uh, sends itself forward uh, into the public. It doesn't always ask for permission. Uh, it is just the voice of the people. Um, it doesn't have to have a political message. Inherently, it is political. Um, and with that, I was like, well, I want to try to reach out to a sector of people who I think are underrepresented in the arts in general um, and underrepresented in graffiti for sure. So when I presented my proposal, I said I wanted to work with uh, Fall Art Studio, which is a art studio off of Penn Avenue um, in Garfield. It works with adults with developmental disabilities. Um, so these artists, like, they are amazing. Some of their artists like have wait lists of like over a hundred people waiting on them to sell art pieces, what like six thousand pieces. Uh, yeah, so they're killing it. And uh, but I was like, well, I never seen like people with those kinds of disabilities represented in muralism or graffiti. So I was like, all right, uh, these guys will let me do that. So I will only well, goes up to get them all paid and. Get, uh, a bunch of professional muralists to teach them how to paint murals. So, yeah, I, I guess what I, I came with to Vanka was saying, hey, Vanka did some pretty radical stuff, some pretty progressive stuff, um, really challenge the status quo. Um, you guys are, would be able to provide me that same opportunity to address that within a field that I come from, which is muralism, but spray can art muralism. Yeah. Thank you. Long answer. No. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so, like I said, uh, um, I grew up in southwestern Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh is my home city, but I had never seen the murals until I returned after college. 
I graduated from Vassar with a degree in Latin American studies, uh, specifically focusing on Mexican history and social movements. So when I saw the the murals of Max Ovenga, I was like, holy cannoli, it's, you know, it's Orozco in Pittsburgh. It's, uh, his work is a perfect connection to the Mexican muralist movement that was really popular at the same time. So if you think of famous people like Diego Rivera, right? And so the, uh, the, what I took from my seeing the murals, having this background in uh, Mexican history, and what I tried to incorporate into my work and my community engagement piece where I was doing lots of art making with families and the Latino Family Center um, was really to, I think Tim described it as a Protestant critique of Catholic sainthood, but the idea, the, but just the idea that we all have our own divinity, we have our own grace, um, you know, we might not fulfill the Catholic Church's, you know, requirements for sainthood, but, you know, there's somebody in your life that is a saint, and to somebody, you might be a saint in their life. Um, so that's where, in my project, I uh, tried to engage families uh, from immigrant communities, uh, especially, as I mentioned, the Latino Family Community Center. I worked with their after-school program to help them sort of imagine themselves in the language of Vanka. So thinking like, what are, what are the artistic symbolisms of, of sainthood? And how can I then see myself in that and elevate my own traits and dispositions to that kind of level of, of power and grace? And so I, for my final piece, I decided to do a, a head in a hole. So you can go downstairs and actually put your head and decide if you want to be the mom or the kid. Um, so that's supposed to be me and my daughter. I have a four-year-old. Um, I can. She's holding like a, a death rattle because you know, as kids, they're they remind us of innocence, but they also remind us of our own mortality, and they're just pure agents of chaos. Um, I have like the multi-armed, which is much more common in, in sort of like Eastern religions and Hinduism, um, because it just is such an easy way to show the multifaceted multitudes you have to be as, as an artist, as a mother. Um, and, you know, even off to the side, kind of behind my back, I have my vices that kind of keep me a very grounded human, right? I'm, you know, I've got my, my phone, I've got my cigarette, the things that kind of take me out of that space as well. But, you know, I have a trowel there, I'm a gardener and herbalist, I've got my pencil as an illustrator, and then I'm fanning cards because I, I do um, practice astrology and cardomancy, so that's something I do professionally. So all of these different aspects of me, and there's still a part of me that's trying to nourish my child and, and make sure I'm keeping her healthy and happy. Um, so yeah, that's I think I jumped ahead on our questions, but really trying to just accept in myself too the fact that um, as a as a parent, as an artist, uh, there's uh, so many expectations and so much weight we put on our own shoulders to, to meet some ideal that society has given us, whether it's a saint or what's your perfect mom, what's your perfect artist, um, and trying to just personalize that, kind of release some of that. Um, and, and I always like try to be playful um, and try to find ways that people can interact with my work um, off the wall, in a way. So hopefully, people will go and imagine themselves. Well, first, I just want to thank Anna and Corey for being very patient <laughs> with this yielder. <laughs> um, because uh, some of the aspects of this project um, when I first applied, I had one idea. And by the time we got around to it, a lot had changed in my life. So I didn't work 
with an organization. I had left a job that was basically rooted in community engagement. And I didn't realize once I left it, I, I just didn't want to do community <laughs> engagement for a long time. So I didn't work with the group. Uh, I applied because of this kinship I felt with the murals, which are intense, terrifying, right? To elicit in people an anti-war sentiment, you almost have to terrify them. You have to give them the vision of what war lo looks like. You may not be on that field. You may not be that person holding the gun. So you have to utilize art to communicate to people who are not going to be actually possibly in war that it is pointless to have war. It is damaging to people's families and their cultures and, and lands, right? So that fascinated me. Um, starting off as a young artist and punk rocker, I am deeply rooted in like social justice before it was called social justice. Um, because we, we think of some of the critiques he has about the way this country has treated immigrants, uh, the way that it is um, consumed by capitalism. This is living in this type of delusional reality that is chock full of oppression. It, all of these things that is presented as America is very much tied to different aspects of oppression. So when I thought of the, the themes, social justice, injustice, motherhood, um, immigration, I, I felt a great need to highlight the trifecta of, of women. Women who keep the families together. Women who've come here. Like, these women represent what America is at some point. Immigration. My, my mother and I are both immigrants. I'm, I'm a baby immigrant, but she's like a full-grown immigrant. Came here August 4th, and um, that just doesn't leave you. Um, and, <laughs> sorry. Full-grown immigrant. <laughs> well, I was a baby. And then um, the other great-grandmother, who I, out of all of them, was the only one I got to meet, um, represents the enslaved people. You cannot have capitalism without recognizing where all that money came from. It came from my ancestors, one aspect of my ancestors, enslaved people, billions of dollars, cotton, tobacco, you name it. You cannot have capitalism without recognizing how it came to be. Then we go to the nebulous, or uh, still trying to find out who she is, Cherokee great-grandmother. And that is also a representation of what manifests destiny. Let's just take, take land from people. Immigrants come here, take, build what is called America. Right? So I felt a great need to bring that type of intensity to this project, that type of history, that type of, if you've done your 23 Me, who are you? Are you sure of who, of your identity? And as I also say, is when anthropologists dig in the land of America, they're not going to find you. And we can call yourself Americans, but we've come over here, whether we decided to or we were sold to. We've come to escape famine. We've come to escape war which is, you know, thinking of his murals and his intensity about war, it makes such sense because, you know, the Croatian people are escaping. So this, you know, this place was meant to become a, a refuge, so I kind of wanted to infuse it as well. This kind of, I kind of almost turning into like a saint, but um, treating our, the woman in our lives as saints. I love all of those breakdowns. Um, I think that I think it speaks to the connection of how 
emotionally, I don't want to say jarring that the murals are, but I believe that when you see them, you're going to feel something. It's going to tie you back to, you know, some sense of your own being, some sense of your own history. Um, and I think that that just speaks to how powerful the murals are because, you know, this is 85 years, right? This is, so this whole thing is, you know, commemorating 85 years um, since Max Lavanka created those murals. And one of the most uh, emotionally connecting uh, things about the murals is that they're still relevant. Like every subject um, that Max Lavanka was expressing through these murals is still going on. You know, injustice is still injustice is still going on. We still need justice. Um, you know, immigration uh, is at a height. You know, immigration issues are at a height right now. Um, you know, motherhood. Uh, you know, all of these situations with uh, abortion and you know rights and stuff like that. So I just think that it's very telling that you know, the artists were able to still get something out of the murals because the murals are very relevant, if not more so then than they are now. Um, so I think that that just speaks to the power of the, the murals and also the power of the artists to be able to, you know, really get something out of their vision and use the, the murals as inspiration to continue to tell a narrative that needs to be told. Um, Please tell us about your creative process for your work in the show and in general. Uh, let's start with Maggie. Okay. Um, so I am a graphic designer. Um, as my work with as the art director of Women in Sound, I do a lot of book layout. Um, I do uh, so I approach a lot of my artwork uh, from a, a design thinking point of view. Uh, if you're familiar with that process. I like working with clients. I think that's why I like um, commissions like this. There's a, a prompt and almost like a problem that I need to solve with art. Um, and what do I need to communicate and how I can get people to interact with that message. Uh, so that's, that's like a, a real big look at how I approach artwork. But for this process in general, um, specifically actually more is working with the students, uh, creating um, an educational workshop to really capture a lot of different perspectives from other people. Uh, that's, the, that's sort of the collection point of design thinking, where we're trying to get as many weird ideas as possible. And then from there, my brain's like, OK, all of that can kind of filter and settle, and I can start making the work. Um, I kind of had the idea for a head in a hole, though, like way at the beginning. Like I knew I wanted to do a head in a hole, um, just to to just be strange and weird. Because I I do most of my artwork is um, as an illustrator is paper, is printed material, um, and usually is not very big. So I was like, how can I do something big to capture the life of uh, these murals? but that still kind of has the same quality as when I hand you one of my zines, one of my books, that you can then interact with it. How can I bring that to something big? And that's where I kind of came to the head and the whole idea. So that was lingering, but through my workshops, that's when I started to really say, okay, well, seeing other students define their sainthood, who, how, is, how am I a saint? Like, that's the question I'm asking everyone else. I needed, I needed about a month and a half of workshops to think about it. <laughs> I was giving students, you know, 45 minutes. <laughs> I think that's, that's my, my little tight answer. <laughs> oh, my process, I would love to say, is as organized as my my arts administration life, it is not as chaotic and emotional 
it, I, I will start off with an idea and then I go so many places that, are, that those places are filled with light or darkness. Right? And I um, attack the idea from all different angles. Like, I, you know, like I'm like, is this it? Is this worth it? Should I, you know? And um, I typically, you know, I work in lots of different disciplines, but like Maggie, most of the time my work is smaller. Now, I need to say that um, I'm in some way returning to an arts practice. Um, I spent 15 years working as an arts administrator, and even though I kept making work, it was not, you know, you don't get to fully invest yourself, right? So invest yourself like your full heart and your mind and your spirit, right? It's usually, there's always a little piece that's given over here to everybody else, right? So this was a, a, a chance to kind of pour my whole self into a piece that I haven't been able to do in a long time and um, also wanted it to be big. <laughs> I wanted to kind of tower just you know, when I think, I think in music, I think in text, so I, you know, I'm hearing this kind of music of coming forth from these three great grandmothers as they kind of tower over you. That was the idea, to kind of um, illustrate their power. But, you know, I'm also dealing with uh, an invisible disability, so it was a challenge um, using my body again in that manner and um, trying to remember, have that, you know, rebuild the muscle memory. And so, yeah, there were a lot of, you know, paintbrushes were thrown. Yes. That's some of my process. Love it. Yes. Yeah. Um, so mine kind of existed in multiple phases. Uh, I don't think you got a photo of like the actual like mural that we made. No, um, not in Garfield. No. Yeah, so, um, so, like I said, uh, I got a group of six different professional muralists uh, to work with the artists at Ball Art Studio. I think in total, with the Ball Artists, we worked with like, I think like 12 of their artists. Um, but each day for five days, there was a different guest artist. Um, yeah, was like Nick Sardo, Dave Scott Rosevich, Shane Pilster, Jerome Chu Charles, um, what's his name? Ashley. Ashley Oder, yeah. Um, and then Brian Gunnell helped out too. But um, so yeah, each day those muralists would show up. They would show them some of their artistic process as a muralist. We would have these wood panels set up. We actually had like uh, two more of those giant wood panels and probably like kind of ten more of those little ones. We had them outside and we were just spray painting, using paint markers, uh, using some brush paint here and there. So, so every single day we'd be going over ourselves and just using this almost like as a practice. Um, and just, I guess, also just kind of embracing like the temporality of graffiti and muralism. Uh, if you're in that field, a lot of your art just gets hung over, the building gets destroyed, uh, new ownership comes in. So yeah, just kind of getting used to that of like not having this preciousness of art or uh, understanding like the impermanence of like just, yeah it's, it's fine it's gone it's, it's a collaborative process um so yeah these pieces here are just some of the end results of those five days of us just working and working on top of each other um yeah if, if you get close you'll see all the layers of paint and a lot of wild stuff going on uh and as far as like the content i really didn't want any parameters for that. Uh, the only, like, I guess, condition was just that I, whatever you want on there, put it on there. Um, I didn't want to make this about, oh, art about disability, or like art about um, like their their specific voice. I don't want to like marginalize them even further. Uh, it's just about them having the ability to have a voice. Uh, and rather than making art about representation, I just prefer to make art that is representation. Uh, so just putting those people in those positions of power, putting those people in positions where their art is able to be seen. Um, so yeah, I, I love what we come up with. It's uh, a lot of my art, uh, commercially, professionally, like I said, history paint is a lot uh, less 
wild and messy. Um, actually, there's one a mural I have across the street, um, the Duquesne substation, that like brown red brick building on that corner. Um, yeah, I just finished that recently. Um, so if you've seen that, then that's like very graphic. Uh, although I do a lot of portraiture and a lot of like very rendered things, um, a lot of that does not look like this. But I have loved this so much. Um, and then from that, uh, since those artists got all that experience with working with spray cans, um, we then had the director of Ball Art Studio get a composition together of all the those 12 artists' drawings and make a composition. We then invited out all of the guest artists and over, I think, a week, we all collaboratively made a mural on a wall that's on the side of Ball Art Studio. I think it was about like, uh, 18 feet wide by like 55 feet wide, so it's pretty massive. Um, yeah, and uh, the content on that, if you've seen it, if you pass by, it's a lot of funny cartoon characters, um, yeah, like just rainbows everywhere. We've titled it uh, Rainbow Club. Um, I can't remember the rest of the name, but uh, there, there's a lot of ancient alien references because one of the girls, Kim, uh, from Vault, she loves ancient aliens. She's actually like this. Um, I mean, she was like in her late sixties, and even when we first gave her a spray can, just like the paint on the wood panels, she just like went straight up to the wall and started like tagging the wall. And I was like, hell yeah! Like, <laughs> if you're not supposed to be doing that, but whatever. Like, uh, uh, but yeah, so and that's just kind of like, like I just gave them the materials and. It's crazy. They're not even looking at references. They just went at the wall and did whatever was in their mind. Like uh, this one guy, uh, Lee. Yeah, he just kept doing like the Three Stooges a bunch, and that was like, sick. Like he just got that locked in. Uh, I wish I had a photo to show you guys, but yeah, if you're in Garfield, Penn Avenue, um, right across the street from Spack Brothers. I don't know if you guys go to Garfield at all, but uh, if you don't, you should. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I guess another plug for Carfield also, if you can get the young people out, every first Friday of the month, um, all the galleries on Penn Avenue uh, in Garfield have exhibition openings. One of those galleries is Boom Concepts. Uh, that's obviously the place that all of us have worked with. Um, yeah, so if you guys are looking for cool stuff to do, uh, it's, a, it's a cool hit thing to do to go to first Friday. Um, yeah. And then we keep referencing Boom Concepts also. Boom Concepts is a visual art gallery and studio. Uh, they also do a lot of like social activism work. Um, it's also just a community space. Uh, they, uh, they, they've grown up quite a lot. They have like funding from the Kinds Endowment now, so they're, they're, they're the big boys now. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, so if you're, if you're, I guess another way you could see the mural. Semi shameless plug on Instagram, uh, Good Boy Gems, like GTMS. That's like, I posted it on there, so that's a place to see it. But, uh, that's like a subtle way to be like, go, go follow me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yeah, also, like, huge shout out to uh, Boom Concepts. Uh, they've been uh, integral in my. Creative process, at creative process as an artist, and you know everybody up here has worked closely with Boom Concepts, so I just want to give them a shout out. They are on Instagram, so if you would love to, you know, be abreast about what's going on in the arts world in Pittsburgh, I would encourage you to follow Boom Regular Spelling and Concepts Regular Spelling on Instagram and all of their social media platforms. Um, what else? Uh, tell us about your experiences. Oh, he's here? There he is. Oh, he's here. Hi. Hey, Hi. Hey, everybody. Yeah. Did you drive? Yeah. Everyone get validation. Sorry, buddy. You get it. You get it. Chat was crazy. Army so early. Q, we asked two questions already. Um, so I'm going to give you the same questions. 
that and have to run to a, a restaurant. So <laughs> um, please, yeah, I didn't want to make it awkward. Oh, I don't want to make it, oh, he's not, he's done. No. Um, please discuss what it was specifically about Fonka's murals and or themes that inspired you to create the piece that you did. Um, the, the themes, mine, um, I went with, well, initially I wanted to discuss the uh, injustice part or justice part with the nonprofit I paired with, with uh, Amasha Pittsburgh, and they deal with parents of incarcerated parents, uh, parents, children of incarcerated parents. But um, the children actually decided to go with motherhood, which was a shock to me, but um, after many meetings and, and discussions, they all the children in Nashville seem very, very close with their mother or grandmother. So I went with that direction and um, got some in input from what they uh, shared with me, and I was pleasantly shocked, but uh, I decided to go with motherhood. All right. Um, please tell us about your creative process for your work in the show and in general. Um, I say it all the time, my creative process is 100% based around fun, like traffic's not fun. <laughs> if I'm not having fun, I can't be creative. So, hanging out with the kids at Machi, um, me being in the education background, and just having fun, brainstorming with kids, throwing ideas, and connecting with that generation because I learned a whole lot from them. It was just fun. I always have to be having fun. So, it makes me great. I need a lot of input to get out, uh, give output. So. Great, great. Um, so I'm going to go with Maggie with this question. Uh, I understand that each artist worked with a particular group during the time they were creating their Give to America 2.0 piece. Please tell us about that experience. Go. Um, so, uh, <laughs> I, I mentioned I work, uh, I'm partnering with two different organizations, so with Boom Concepts that we talked about. Um, the founders of Boom Concepts are good friends of mine. Um, our daughters play together. And so in very casual conversations, it's like, hey, have, I have this commission through the Maxavenka mural. You know, have you ever seen the murals? And, and a lot of the Boom Concepts artists who are Pittsburgh natives had never seen them. So we coordinated a, uh, a Sunday where people came over. We had a tour of the murals. And then we had art making and food in the basement. Um, it was really just amazing to see everybody's reaction to the artwork that's within our own city. It's, um, you know, we think that all of the, the most important work is in our, the Carnegie Museum or the Andy Warhol Museum, but we really do have, fit, like, I know everyone's telling you, oh my god, these murals, but like seriously, oh my god, these murals, go see them. Um, and getting their reactions as natives was hugely important to my process. Um, but then I also wanted to work and touch upon the, a more direct immigrant experience. And so I partnered with the Latino Family Community Center. They have an after school program. And so I was, um, I did a three day workshop with the students where they learned about the murals. We kind of, um, I tied the murals uh, and like learning about uh, the different themes and artistic motifs. And I still connected it to Encanto and like the doors mm -hmm. because it was a really great like just like pop culture on the ground reference for the kids to be like, oh yeah, I understand like symmetry in, in like the Encanto doors and I can see the symmetry in the Maxovenka murals and these themes of nature and radiance. So giving the kids more of a language to talk about the work and then um, actually create their own artworks and imagine themselves as, as saints. So it was really, I love working with the Latino Family Center's after school program. Um, I mentioned I'm a, uh, you know, of Mexican descent. My family is the type of family though where uh, my father grew up speaking Spanish but by the time he got to school he was told not to speak Spanish. So uh, I've had to learn Spanish through school. And so getting to work with that, uh, their after school program is, is just so wonderful to, 
you know, I, I call it like my cultural reappropriation, where I'm, you know, able to actually connect back to a language my family spoke and, and be able to work with the students who are both are bilingual and seeing how they respond to someone who can speak to them in both of their languages is, is really great. So, yeah, that's those are my organizations. Thank you. Uh, what was the question? Uh, so basically, like, uh, you know, tell us about how, how it was to work with your partner organization, you know, the whole process. Uh, it, it was actually, it's actually a long story because maybe 10 years ago, I worked with Machi Pittsburgh just as a volunteer, and they hired me part-time. Just once a month working with um, young adults, and we had a previous history, but I love the organization because um, I believe it's what, 60% of the uh, children of incarcerated parents, 60 percent of them, they get incarcerated themselves. So I feel like the organization is very much needed. And plus, at that time, I was just solely education. But now I get to show the children, you know, there's other ways to flourish and be creative. And um, it was it was really cool how I got to come back, hang out with, and talk with the director, and catch up, and let the kids know, like I used to work with this program years ago, and it's still around. We're still doing cool stuff. This is what we're doing, and, and just the collaboration, it, you can start to see the, the wheels churn in their head because uh, the director shared with me a few of the, the students were interested in being designers or artists or graphic designers, but often, you know, children, especially in urban areas, they don't get to see, touch, and speak with artists or creatives of you know their racial background. So I thought that was really cool, and. Um, the previous history definitely helped, and um, it was just a no-brainer for me. You know, anytime we can help our children, I'm always for it. For sure, for sure. Max, um, I guess I did touch on like a lot of the, the process working with Vault, but I guess like my my connection to Vault is literally just like from first Friday going to those shows and just like meeting all the artists and just. Uh, like seeing how much the artwork at Fall Art Studio just stands out compared to everything on that block. Like yes, the, all the other artwork and all those other galleries are great, but like you walk into like Fall Art Studio and you're like, oh my god, like this is like nothing I've ever seen before. Like it, it's just fun. Like it's, it's a good time. Uh, like the last show they did there, it was all like WWE themed. Uh, and like there was like uh, someone built sculptures of like wrestlers and had a wrestling ring. Uh, yeah, I think they sold like half the pieces in the show. And, um, yeah, so just having that experience and knowing that like there is such a poor representation of people with disabilities and people with developmental disabilities, or it, that in in the arts that is there is that underrepresentation. Um, but knowing that they're producing these amazing art pieces uh, and that. Like within their own, like I guess studios, they're doing amazing and get being very prosperous. But I uh, just seeing the strange dis disconnect where it's like, why, why have been, why why have been people taking the initiative to like get them into larger galleries or to get their work uh, in exterior spaces displayed? Uh, and actually, I guess my first experience with trying to get better representation of those people, uh, those types of people, um, is through Fran Flaherty, who's a lot of our mutual friends. Um, but she connected me with uh, this artist, Matthew Carroll, um, and he actually had a design, and he needed to paint it on a shipping container because they wanted him to paint a mural on a shipping container downtown. I think it was for the Office of Public Arts, like mobile gallery in the studio and office space. Um, so yeah, we I like taught him the mural process and we just recreated his imagery on that. And I mean that was like a life changing experience for me. Like where like yes, I was there like it sounds funny. Like I, I was there to be like, oh, I'm here to teach you but then he taught me and uh, <laughs> yeah, but it, it really was just like wow, like I haven't gone about like a mural process that's just like fun and just about like just getting a pure uh, 
like depiction of, of, of your interests on a wall. Um, yeah, so that it definitely like spawned a desire to like get to work with those communities more. Yeah, so thanks, Paul. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being able to highlight those people because I definitely think that you know their, their representation is lacking, um, and that's something that we, as a, our community, uh, need to be more thoughtful of. Is just you know understanding that there are a lot of people's voices who don't get heard and don't get highlighted. So I want to thank you and thank each each of you for highlighting those different voices um, in your work and. You know, just some work that you do generally. Um, please tell us about your experiences as an artist in Pittsburgh today. How did you become? How did you come to be an artist? I think we'll go with Christiana first. Uh, both my parents are artists, so I grew up around it, and um, it was kind of like a uh, house was on a corner, so. All of the, you know, I'm really honored to have grown up in Bell Super because I, th I thought of it as a, a mecca of black artists because they were all at our house. Right? <laughs> so my father's a jazz musician, um, an inventor of games, a silk screenist, and my mother's a painter. Uh, so this was all part of just growing up. Every aspect of everything we kind of did had a creative moment to it, like even the way you would put the napkins down had to be a certain kind of way where you had to uh, express creativity. Um, from there I went to Saturday art classes at the museum and I, I forget the teacher's name but I want to thank her for I guess in some sense nominating me for this because that was kind of like a big turning point in my life because as you're saying like Besides, you know, growing up in a household full of art, you don't really see representations definitely at that time. There were, I didn't encounter any black art teachers, so to have this ability to kind of take a more uh, structured approach to learning art. And then from there, the CMU uh, Saturday program for high school students, which led to lots of different um, Stopping points I didn't quite finish. I went to Carnegie Mellon University. I went to uh, Leder Seminar in Switzerland, Taylor School of Art. Went to a lot of these places. There's something about institutions that I don't really work well with. <laughs> and um, I needed to be with people. So I didn't finish my degree because so I thought, I don't want to become a professor, so why am I doing this? I, I want to be an artist, and I want to be with the people. I want to be with regular people. I don't want to be in a space where I'm constantly looking out the window, wishing I was with <laughs> everyday people. So it took me, I traveled a lot. I worked in Alaska um, in the fisheries on a very small island. Um, I worked on a farm, an organic farm in upstate New York. And then a bunch of friends and I, we got into our vehicles. I had a Volvo, and it was a pop-top kind of car. We drove out to the southwest. We did put our feet on the corner, <laughs> the famous four corners. Um, we lived out of our cars. Uh, one of the, there were like five of us, and one of them was a great, he was a great illustrator, so We'd go to bars and I would pretend to be his wife so he could sell caricatures of the people he was drawing. So, you know, we had our different hustles going on so we could stay living out on the land with people, you know, meeting a woman who was one of the last uh, women to run one of the biggest ranches in Arizona. You know, I, those are the kind of experiences that feed my arts practice. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> she, I, I, I would just say that, like, I don't know if uh, you all realize, but she's an amazing musician and, and singer as well, so don't let all this music around you. I don't want to forget all your music. Sorry. No. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, my my uh, story, how it became, well, how was my artist experience with these words? Or? Yeah. It's, well, so far it's been interesting. Um, 
I grew up born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, I graduated top of my class, magna cum laude, at the School of Hard Knocks. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I didn't go to art school at all. Um, I initially went to the University of Pittsburgh uh, my freshman year for a physical therapy. Then I just kept bouncing around to majors until I figured out, or not me, my mom did. <laughs> she got sick of paying for school. <laughs> and um, basically kind of gave me an ultimatum. So I got into education, so we going pre-K, doing after-school programs, mentoring, years and years and years of that. But I always was interested in art from birth, all I can remember. And, um, you know, growing up in inner city neighborhood, that's typically not something discussed or even an option that you can do. It's usually what you see is jail or you know, illegal activities, football, basketball, those were, or even rapping, but it's usually never visual arts in any form. But uh, I was always good at it. People were saying, you should do something with this. And, and in my head, because no one told me I could do it, in my head, I was like, nah, nobody's doing that. I don't want to do that. But um, it was just fun. And then my mom sat me down, you know, after we bounced around from various universities. And she said, what would you do every day for free? And I'm like, I all every day. And um, I started thinking, maybe I could do this. And then I entered in a show in my late 20s and pretty much sold everything. I didn't know what I was doing. And then I'm like, this, this is, could be a career, it could be something. And then I started learning more about the craft, more learn, learning about the business and then the culture. And Pittsburgh, there, there is a pretty old, rich art history, but you have to learn it because it's really not out in the open and really not publicized, you know, because we're all, you know, blue collar, dirty, hardcore, still workers. But um, there's a pretty cool, rich art history in the city, which I found out with the Vodka murals. It, it's pretty cool. And it makes you kind of forget, it, it sounds terrible to say, it makes you forget you're in Pittsburgh. You, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of gems around here. It makes you forget you're actually in Pittsburgh because you really have to go looking for them. And um, hopefully I can consider one of those gyms one day. But uh, that's the goal. But my art artistic experience in Pittsburgh, it's been pretty good. It's what you make of it. So it's been pretty good too. You are a town now. I'm trying to make it. You're a town now. I appreciate it. Not to mention the, the gems. Coincidentally. Coincidentally. How many of I used to always see it. Tag all over the city years, like years ago, and I never met him. And then we were working on a project one day, and somebody said, "Who that is?" And like the guy working next to me, and I was like, "Oh, that's that's pretty cool." Yeah. So, so <laughs> um, yeah, so I I've just been like drawing my whole life. Uh, and a lot of my references for drawing were always just graffiti, because uh, that's what I grew up around in anime. So just constant graffiti anime, shadow anime. Uh, <laughs> <You're wearing laughs> <a little. laughs> um, yeah, so I really like didn't ever imagine a career uh, like in the arts. Uh, actually, like a whole funny moment where like way back when my parents saw me like drawing graffiti all the time. And as a joke, my mom was like, oh, maybe someday you'll be a graffiti artist. And I was like, hooked on that. I was like, yes. Like, and then later on, I brought up to her, and she's like, oh, no, honey, that's not real. That's not like a real thing. And I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, anyways, I, in high school, I just had an art teacher that like was amazing and just like saw that I could draw. And like uh, he was just kind of like, hey, you got, some, you, know, you got some skills in this. Like, You should start working on building a portfolio. Uh, and then I started hanging out in the art room literally every day, and that led to me uh, getting a full ride scholarship to go to CMU. Um, I've never been to Pittsburgh until the day before I moved in. I just showed up. I was like, "Oh, this is like a city, kind of." Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I I went to CMU, uh, but like I always like when I applied to CMU, like there was never any connection between my graffiti. And like my fine art, like there, I never said, oh yeah, and I do graffiti. Uh, even when I was in college, it was like I was a printmaker. Like I wasn't advertising, like yeah, I'm, uh, like doing graffiti art too. Um, but yeah, I I went to CMU, graduated, I worked there. Um, 
I taught there. Uh, they didn't pay me nearly enough. Uh, yeah, CMU. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, you to tell me. Like, uh, and actually, partially what led to my art career was me getting arrested. And I was arrested because uh, one of these staff members at CMU, a staff member that wasn't a professor, just some tech lending guy at the art building, uh, had a suspicion that I did graffiti in my freshman year, stole my backpack, uh, which had my, my DSLR camera, like sketches, drawings, like class schedules, everything. Uh, so perfect incrimination. And he did that without any consent or knowledge of like anyone from the university. At the time, the graffiti task force was dismantled. So he waited four years for it to be reinstated in 2016. Here I was graduating, uh, I handed that over straight to the task force. I'm like, yes, we do have a graffiti task force in Pittsburgh, which is nuts. Um, yeah, and that was the whole case. And then he was like the lead and only informant on my case. And uh, and for whatever reason, the university was like, nah, that's not him. And it's like, I'm like, yo, it literally says it right here. And then. <laughs> I went on to go work at the university and uh, had to work with this dude. We were both staff members there. And uh, he wouldn't even look at me in the eyes. I tried to shake his hand and said, No, it's all right. But yeah, I wouldn't even do that. Scurried away. Uh, so I have a very, very complicated relationship with CMU. Um, <laughs> uh, they even, uh, like, I graduated with honors and like worked there. And then eventually the architecture department brought me back for a semester. Be a guest artist and lecturer um, to work with a like a robotics uh, like department, and uh, they didn't even know that I went to CMU. Like they just knew me from like my graffiti. Uh, so they were because I was in one of the buildings. They were like, I didn't know this space so well. I was like, I, I went here. Like and they're like, Oh, we didn't know that. Like so even going to CMU wasn't a qualifier enough for me to be working at CMU or like be a guest there. Um, so yeah, like definitely all of my art career is a result of uh, graffiti. Um, my my muralism, that's like my career, that's that's what I do. All that comes from spray paint. Uh, and really like the kickstart, jump start to me being like, all right, I gotta make some money, uh, was that I got sentenced to $58,000 of restitution and I don't get off of probation I'll get it off and so I was like I'm gonna be on probation for the rest of my life so I was like alright I need to start paying that off uh, maybe I can just roll with this gems thing and I got like blown up in the news like crazy they were like Pittsburgh's most wanted it was like on NPR and all these news stations and stuff and I was like this is super stupid but I was like alright I'll roll with that and uh, yeah I think my first like real real mural uh, was with Central Outreach on the center it's a uh, health center for um, queer individuals uh, and like people, addicts and people at risk um, on the North Shore. And uh, since then, I've done like, four different murals for them. So shout out to the outreach. Um, yeah. So and every year, there's been more and more murals. And now my life is consumed by it. I don't sleep. Yeah. <laughs> Nonstop. Good job. Good job. Maggie. Uh, so, um, I grew up in a family business that was a small printer, so grew up around print shops. My mom was a graphic designer and illustrator. She's now retired, but she's trying her, her, to start her second life as a pattern designer, so, um, art is, is something that's always been a part of my life. Uh, I grew up with a lot of musicians in my family. Um, and, but I was like the egghead, I was like the really like smart kid and everybody was like, Maggie, don't be an artist, you're too smart, go to school for something else. And I thought I'd be a chemist, um, thought I would become an archaeologist, and then was lucky that when I was in college, um, so Vassar is a, is a university, uh, is a college that does not have graduate programs. There's no graduate programs there. So it's all under undergrad. I got to know my a lot of my professors really well. And my plan at the time was like become a professor, become like a scholar. And they were like, Maggie, the 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 like the lay of the land is not looking good for 
being a professional professor, unless you're really in love with the scholarship. And I was, in, I like teaching. I like really like that education portion. So they kind of convinced me to, in the middle of my college degree, not to pursue it beyond my undergraduate degree. So I didn't know what to do. Um, I didn't know really what I was going to do with my education. Um, but when I moved back to Pittsburgh, you know, it's my home city. I just was. All my friends were artists. I had been, you know, an artist and a scholar all through my life. It's always been something I had done. When I was in college, I even made the decision, okay, I'm gonna stop carting around my bass guitar and my saxophone because I'm gonna just focus on drawing because I can draw anywhere as long as I have a notebook and a pen. Um, and I was always doing graphic design for people's, you know, on like school magazines. So it was something that, that I'd always been doing on the side. And then when it suddenly became, okay, all those other professions don't seem like they're gonna pan out in the economy, I graduated right at the height of like that big recession in 2009, 2010. So it was like, nobody's getting jobs. Guess I'm just gonna draw and teach. And I ended up uh, getting a, a job at the Greater Pittsburgh Arts Council where Christiana was working. Um, and again, it's one of those Pittsburgh things, like opportunities find opportunities. I got hired by a woman that I had done community theater with. So she already knew me, knew my work ethic, but it was like the arts that connected us. Um, and so luckily, through Christiana's mentorship and, you know, the community, we have a pretty... As much as we do and we don't, we, we I think as for the size of our city, we have a pretty decent like artistic network and support systems for better or worse our foundations that give us the money to make the art um, is pretty robust for our small city um, and I just I think it, art is just like my native language and that's kind of how I how I respond to things is always trying to think of an artistic approach so yeah, that's, that's my I answer. would say like you know, you know, I moved back to Pittsburgh because of some of what you're saying. Because I didn't find in other cities, New York included, uh, community that was supportive. Right. Um, I found here that people will share opportunities. Yes, everything's competitive. There's, you know, but I think the attitude here was like, well, let's see, whoever gets it gets it, right? Mm -hmm. If there was a, a great sharing of resources, of knowledge, um, that I, I just was not, and I thought it was ironic because I was traveling everywhere to get away from Pittsburgh. <laughs> and I ended up coming back because of the, t the people here, the community here, and how supportive they are of the arts. That doesn't erase the fact that um, there are challenges in, in how artists are supported. Um, there are challenges in what type of art is supported, how much they're, what kind of funding is available for them. Um, so, you know, that kind of led me to become an arts administrator to kind of utilize my experience as an artist, which ranges like music, theater, all this kind of stuff, and knowing that college can't give you everything because when it comes down to the, the brass and tacks, as they say, um, you, you gotta hustle, and, and to know how to hustle to know how to do your hustle and to make that money, to pay off whatever, um, you have to know how to work. And you have to know how to work with people and how to be with people. And you have to know how to find what it is that you need. And so kind of being that liaison for lots of artists has been like an, an honor for me to do that. So thank you, thank you. I went to um, Penn State University over the summer to do like a multicultural journalism workshop and I did a multicultural journalism workshop at Point Park University. Then I went to, you know, I, went to, I started a college at Silver Rock University. Um, I was thinking about being a journalism major. The major was really hard. I was failing classes and, I, you know, at the same time I was really interested in poetry. So I started taking a lot of um, creative writing classes and poetry classes. Um, so my major is actually like 
creative writing. It's like, um, it's professional studies, because <laughs> I was there for five years, so I was a professional student. Um, so the, the major was actually like professional studies with a concentration uh, in communications and creative writing. So on my, on my breaks, like summer breaks and winter breaks, I would um, do open mic nights at like, you know, whatever it was open mic night. At this time, uh, the Shadow Lounge was very popular. It was like one of the, it's, it's like an institution. It's a Pittsburgh institution as far as, um, yeah, as far as uh, music and poetry and, you know, just creativity is concerned. It was located in uh, pre-gentrified East Liberty. Just have to say that out loud. Um, so I would go and I would perform. Um, Sometimes, like before I got my name, I would just be like, oh, it's Corey coming to the stage. And I didn't really feel confident with that name. So I was like, you know, I'm, I'm saying wild stuff on stage. So I was like, yo, I need a name. And then one day I was just on the bus and I was like, I'm a big fan of Wu-Tang Clan. And they all like give themselves mafia last names. So I was like, Grits, Capone, <laughs> Grits, Capone. And then from there, I was just like, all right, I'm going to go on stage on Chris Capone. I'm going to be saying these wild things. So I would be going, I would be going to like, you know, I got better. People would start asking me to perform, but they, when I asked them about like, hey, can you pay me? They were like, oh, you know, this is a really good opportunity. You'll get a lot of exposure, blah, blah, blah. So long story short, they were not paying me. So I was like, all right, well, if I have some artwork that I can have while I'm performing, if people like my performance, they buy the artwork. So that led me to do start doing visual artwork. And, you know, at the same time, I was like, you know, I really have a degree. Like, so there were like the, the job market was kind of like dead end, and I was just like, all right, well, you know, I I don't really want to work for a corporate company, and I'm an artist, so like, let's do this artist administration thing. So uh, my mom, who's like my de facto manager, she sends me jobs and basically everything. So she sent me this opportunity um, with Contemporary Craft. They were looking for the emerging black arts leader apprentice. So that's basically a way to say like, yo, there's not enough black people in arts administration and then we need more diversity. So I did this apprenticeship for a year long um, in 2016 to 2017 and then after that, you know, people start hitting me up, hey, would you like to curate this exhibit? And really for me, it's like, I, I can't say no to anything because uh, I need money. So, <laughs> so the, 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 all the different art you know, disciplines that I do, it's really out of necessity. It's like, so, you know, I have my own, I curate exhibits, I sell my own artwork, I have my own clothing line, people pay me to perform poetry, I'm a journalist, you know, these are all things, so I'm like, you know, I never want to be broke, so I have to do and conquer as many artistic disciplines as I can so I can keep you know, bringing in that bag, so that's really, that's kind of like my, that's my artistic journey. Um, can I five you on that? Yes. Because yes. <laughs> artists need money. Can I just say, we're almost at 5.30, Dad had to leave, so. And I just wonder, this is one of those wonderful just things that you can do for us from the audience? Sure. The audience, would love it. If we gave you a whole long list, we'd be all hiring <laughs> yeah. our questions. Does anybody in the audience have a question for the artists? Somebody. Back artist. <laughs> Do it. Oh yeah, there's one. I mean, this is like kind of like just the question for like. I mean, I guess what inspires an artist to to work? I guess is kind of what I'm saying because like I have like a lot of ideas for like for example, I feel like I have a decent voice, but I never really have any like inspiration for to write songs about or anything so like it's just like something I don't do um do you have any like suggestions for like something like that like or does it just have to fall on you uh, I don't believe in inspiration I, I believe in perspiration <laughs> you just do the work right like so I started this project um called the pantry of salt and sugar and every day I wake up and I write a song. I produce it, I sing it, it's all like improvised. I might write a song about my cat <laughs> or you know it, it, it's whatever or, you know a lot of it's anxiety inspired because I have a lot of anxiety about things. 
But um, yeah, and I just let it flow, and I don't critique myself. Like I think um, it's so important to not critique yourself to the point where you don't even leave the gate. Like if you were a horse, right? You can't just sit there <laughs> like in the gate. Like you can't wait for perfection. It doesn't exist, right? Don't don't critique yourself to the point where you don't let your voice shine. Because someone, a lot of someone's may need to hear your voice. Right, so when you're not just doing you and doing your art, in some way you are, I don't want to make you feel guilty, you keep people from what you need to say, right? Like we all have something in us to share with the world, whether it's through art or whether it's through science, right? And so the world will benefit from you shining your light. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to add, um, I think, so I'm going to preface this as every artist is an entrepreneur. So this advice goes for if you're an artist or if you're an entrepreneur of some type, whatever it is. If you don't have to be everything in your art, in your in your art or whatever career, in your entrepreneurial career, you don't have to be anything. Find collaborators. So maybe you're not a songwriter. That's okay. But maybe you still are meant to sing. You know, there's plenty of musicians that don't sing songs that they've written. So free yourself from having to be everything. And like I, as a as a graphic designer, I'm not writing the books, but I make them look good so that you actually want to write them. Somebody out there writes songs but they can't sing and needs you. Next question. Yeah. <laughs> I'll share. Uh, so I think for me, it's that I know what I want to see in the world, and I trust <laughs> that my vision. It, it's 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 usually based on cool. So it's like. I always feel like I'm the coolest person in the room. So my vision, I trust my vision of like, all right, if I have a like if I have a song, if I got a, a rap that I want to do, I trust that like if I come up with it, then that's what it, it needs to come out. Like, so if it's a shirt design, if it's a rap, if it's a poem, if it's a collage, I always trust that like, no, this is cool. So I want to see it. So that's really my motivation for creating. It's not necessarily that there's going to be an end result of like, oh, I'm going to get paid for it, or oh, somebody's going to buy it. It's that it's cool, so it needs to come out of me, and I need to share it. So that's really my main motivation for creating. It's just I got cool stuff in my mind, and I know I trust that other people are going to like it, so let it come out. And if people don't like it, I don't care, because it's, it's, not cool. it's cool for it's cool to me. So, you know, that's that's really my main motivation. But also, maybe I don't know if you guys feel this way too. Like if I'm not doing art, I feel like I'm dying inside. I feel like I'm dying a very slow death. <laughs> I've tried other things and I feel like I'm slowly dying <laughs> at those <laughs> other things, right? I am compelled it's in my blood. I have to to do it, or I'll go and say it, possibly. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> we don't want you to go and Thank you all so very much. This has just been wonderful. Um, we really appreciate all that you shared with us today. We appreciate all of you for coming. If you have not been downstairs to see this exhibit, please do so. We are going to have an exhibit you can see behind you that it's through October 10th. So that's homecoming weekend and it's parents weekend. So if the folks are coming, bring them over, okay? We want them to see this too. Yeah, if you take a picture with my head in the hole, you can tag me on Instagram. Uh, it's M-G-G-L-N-T. I'd love to see it. Mm -hmm. I wish I knew that. We just had a group of weekend and we had all kinds of people take that. Oh, one more thing. I think it's very important. Please tell us how we might buy pieces of your art. Yes, please do. So.
I don't know. Oh, we've been talking about this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't sell my art. Oh, fuck. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, I sell everything. Um, <laughs> I've, been a, I've been a professional artist, about full time artist, about five years now, but I I sell everything. And you got um, just contact me directly, email me cbperryart at gmail.com, or um, check me out on Instagram, cbperry underscore, and just hit me up directly. I sell direct to client. Um, very personable, like you don't have to go through an assistant or middleman or anything like that. I just want to print out what you did. That's another thing about me. I never, 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 not once ever make a print. Uh, yeah, I've, okay. yeah, I've sold over like, okay. yeah, all over the world, 5,000 <laughs> originals. I've never made a print before. I know. I'm just looking at the phone. I'm just looking at the I just I haven't made any art for sale in so long because I'm oh, wow. I don't have some time. But you uh, get commissions. But yeah, yeah, people commission you. Yeah, Can they, they commission you? I uh, commission me to like make art on walls, but I guess uh if I uh, <laughs> I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Owns a business, uh, looking for a mural. Like, even if I don't do it, like I always hand off mural jobs to friends and things. So, uh, yeah. But I just sell shirts sometimes. I don't know. I just don't have time to like make anything. I guess if I am doing a gallery show, I'm more often showing other people's art than my own. Uh, like, yeah, I just did an art show at uh, or old old downtown. That was yeah. I was like, I don't have any art. Like. I like people's show. Oh. Uh, yeah, you can find me online. My uh, Instagram handle is M, like Maggie, G G L N T. Um, I will be vending at a couple of events over the next couple of weekends. On Sunday at the David L. Lawrence Convention Center, I'll be at the Bitchcraft Market. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, October 1st, up in my neighborhood of Allentown, so right across the river, up the hill is the Allentown Night Market. I'll be selling there. It's super fun, lots of, definitely come out. It's, uh, lots of uh, food and, you know, performances up in our neighborhood. And then uh, the following day, the second, I'll be at the Kingsley Association for the Pittsburgh Zine Fair. So check out the Allentown Night Market and the Pittsburgh Zine Fair to Pittsburgh or events that are just awesome. So you can buy dolls, prints, originals, books, etc. on my website, Madame Christiana Dolores. Um, for music, it's Madame Dolores Rocks. <laughs> I have no problem selling. You can also have me come and speak, or tap dance, or be a clown. I've been a clown a couple times. <laughs> I'm selling everything. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram. It's deeper than T H A N Brits. That's my personal handle. Also, you can visit me at www.bigcartel.deeperthanbritsstudios.com. You can buy shirts from me, hats, hoodies. Uh, you can email me at deeper than studios at gmail.com if you want to buy any original artwork from me or you want to hire me to perform as a spoken word artist or if you want to pay me to speak, you can hit me up at that email address. I'm also on Facebook, if you do the Facebook thing, as Corey Carrington, C-O-R-E-Y-C-A-R-R-I-N-G-T-O-N. Um, yeah, and I also have an Instagram page, Deeper Than Grits Studios Instagram. So there's Deeper Than Grits, that's the personal Instagram, Deeper Than Grits Studios, that's the business Instagram, Corey Carrington on Facebook, there's www.deeperthangritsstudios.com, and there's www.bigcartel.deeperthangritsstudios.com where you can buy all my merchandise. Thank you. So that's Deeper Than Grits? <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna check your phones on the <laughs> <way>. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I have a consulting company called Little Box, and uh, I work at the airport, and I manage the performance program. So if you are a performer and would like to perform at the airport, uh, you can just go to the website, um, Arts and Culture, and fill out the application. Thank you all again. Let's